Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. Ominous numbers in Ontario long-term care homes. Our seniors have been and continue to be neglected. Has the government done enough to avoid a devastating autumn? The government of Canada has signed a new agreement. Ottawa buys millions of rapid COVID tests, but when will they be approved for use? We just don't understand why Native women, we have to go through that. An Indigenous woman endures abhorrent slurs from a hospital employee just hours before her death. An appointment and and let the debates begin. Will you who shut up, man? Listen, who is on your list? This We've is so this unprecedented. He's court. It's Trump Maybe versus you know, Biden, round one. This is The National. There is outrage in Quebec tonight after an Indigenous woman on her deathbed was subjected to racist insults by a hospital nurse. As she lay there in devastating pain just on Monday, the woman live-streamed the incident. Today, she is dead. The nurse has been fired. But as Alison Northcott tells us, the story may not end there. Joyce Eshaquan put up this live video from her hospital bed yesterday. <laughs> The mother of seven calls out for help. The distress in her voice is obvious. You can hear other voices too. <laughs> Hospital staff insulting her. <laughs> Eshaquan died shortly after. It's unclear how. Her family says she had gone to the hospital on Saturday with stomach pains. <laughs> Her husband says now, like that, her seven children no longer have a mother. Her death prompted calls of justice for Joyce. At this vigil outside the hospital tonight, demands for change. This is the unacceptable uh, event that we sadly have had to endure for so many, so many decades. Sadness, we're mad, we just don't understand why Native women, we have to go through that. The chief of the Atikamekw Council of Manawan, where Eshaquan was from, describes her as radiant. And says the video is audiovisual proof of systemic racism. This comes nearly a year to the day after the release of a Quebec report with 142 calls to action that found Indigenous people in the province face systemic racism when accessing public services. She was a victim of racism. Today, the Assembly of First Nations of Quebec and Labrador released its own plan to fight that because it says the government isn't doing enough. The release of their plan today, a sad coincidence, says the Assembly's chief. It just serves as a reminder that, you know, that the, 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 I guess the, the mountain is steep, but we have to take it on. Quebec Premier Francois Legault has repeatedly denied systemic racism exists in Quebec. Today, he said there will be investigations into Eshaquan's death. The nurses did something unacceptable and she is being fired. The province says there will be investigations by the coroner and the health authority. But tonight, there are calls to do much more than that. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Joliet, Quebec. The Nova Scotia government apologized today for systemic racism in the province's justice system. Street checks, surveillance, suspicion. White people don't need to think about these things. Black people can't afford not to. Today, I say enough. I want you to know I hear you, I see you, I believe you, and I am sorry. The Premier highlighted various ways the justice system fails black and Indigenous people. He says the time for diagnosis is over, the problem has to be addressed. There's now a plan to restructure the system to eliminate racism and promote equality. The Premier has formed a team to work on including members of the community. So now to a worrisome development when it comes to long-term care homes in Ontario. At least 46 new confirmed COVID-19 outbreaks. This is sparking fears of a potential repeat of the disastrous first wave. Almost 1,900 long-term care residents have died since March. The virus also killed eight staff members and infected more than 100 others. Premier Doug Ford vows history will not repeat itself in Ontario, but as David Common reports, some already have doubts.
Nursing homes are not somehow immune to surging COVID cases in the community, and so little surprise that cases inside Ontario's homes jumped nearly 15% in just a day. We can't let COVID-19 get into these homes. It's a little late for that, as 46 homes report outbreaks mostly in the Toronto and Ottawa areas. That's why, as of Monday, October the 5th, visitors to long-term care homes in these areas will have to be restricted to staff, essential visitors, and essential caregivers only. That move, rather than what happened in the spring, a lockout of all families, is being welcomed by many advocates. Everyone was shut out during the first wave, which meant that not only uh, were residents dying of COVID-19, but many of them were also dying from the conditions of the lockdown. We are still in knee-jerk response. But for families, the worry is ramping up once more. Jacqueline Mitchell's mom's home isn't in outbreak, but in the spring, dozens there died. Our seniors have been and continue to be neglected. There's millions more dollars now coming from the province for facilities like this, Westview in Ottawa, which leads the province with 24 active cases. Money to stock up on PPE, renovations for infection control and more. But the funds come as the second wave has already started. It comes a little too late. These were the kinds of things that experts and advocates in the sector were desperately pleading were needed in June. The latest infections are also striking at staff too, and that has been a sign in the past that COVID will be detected in more residents soon. This is all happening as many care home workers have left the sector completely during the pandemic, fed up with low pay and their working conditions, luring them back now as COVID is again surging. That's gonna be a challenge. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. And compounding those concerns, Ontario's troublingly high infection rate, another 554 cases today. Experts keep hammering away on the need for contact tracing to help curb the spread. Katie Nicholson looks at the province's struggle to keep up. Within two weeks of starting university, Kate Brown tested positive for COVID-19. So like right away, I like texted everyone who I was like with. Turns out she's the only one who contacted them. More than a week later, no one from Ottawa Public Health has asked her who she was with or where she has been. That worries her mother. You think how many other people should have been notified and if they are positive, they're walking around Ottawa. Like it just, it boggles my mind. In Toronto, roughly half of those who test positive are contacted within 24 hours, but the province aims to improve that. We are hiring another uh, 500 people to, uh, to be contact tracers in the future. We also have another 500 that are being provided to us through Statistics Canada. But with numbers skyrocketing above 500 cases a day, this epidemiologist says it's too late. Cases. So you're just never going to keep up with it, with, um, uh, with, with cases at this level. And cases have been slipping through the cracks for months. Some of my ICU colleagues, they've had this happen again and again and again, where they are intubating someone. The test comes back two days later, confirming their suspicion that it was COVID. The family are still still haven't been contacted by public health. It is shared. What's more, facilities. contact tracing isn't just about making one initial call. It's this continuous contact with all of those contacts um, over the incubation period or over this this 14 day period when they're supposed to isolate. Whatever the reason, Kate Brown thinks the lag is unacceptable. I know there's like a huge like backlog in the system, but if I didn't let my friends know or like let the restaurants know like there could have been like a way bigger like spread of it. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec has posted another 799 new cases a day after much of the province was declared a COVID red zone. This leads officials both to crack down and plead with people to just play ball. Now you have a new challenge. 28 days with minimal contacts. I know you can do it. I'm asking all Montrealers and, and people in the entire metropolitan area to do this sacrifice once again, even though we're tired, even though it's difficult. 
For their part, Montreal police are out in force ticketing rule breakers. The city is also targeting people aged 18 to 34 on social media to get tested and not blow off phone calls from contact tracers. 247 Quebecers are currently in hospital with COVID, 35 of them in just the past two days. That dramatic increase in new infections across the country has renewed calls for the federal government to increase testing capacity. Well, today, Ottawa announced a step it says will help, though, as Salima Shibji explains, there's still a hurdle. As the demand for tests keeps growing, so too the pressure on the federal government to speed up the process. There's no one that's been jumping up and down, uh, you know, screaming for the rapid tests more than I have. Rapid tests where a swab can be analyzed on site instead of at a lab, severely cutting down on the wait time to get a result. Ottawa today announcing it's buying one such test that can detect COVID-19 in a matter of minutes. For up to 7.9 million rapid point-of-care tests for COVID-19. Abbott's ID Now is a powerful point-of-care molecular instrument. Only the purchase is pending. It's to reserve a spot in line to get millions of kits for a test that is yet to be approved by Health Canada. In the coming weeks, very, very soon. Compare that to the U.S. It's this easy. Already distributing similar rapid tests approved weeks, even months ago. And you wait 15 minutes, and that is the test. The opposition here is accusing the Liberals of lagging far behind other countries. People around the world have access to at-home testing or rapid testing, and nobody in Canada does. And that's his fault. But the government today defended the pace of approval, saying safety is paramount, with concerns some rapid tests deliver false negatives. As much as we'd uh, love to see those tests as quickly as possible, we're not going to tell our scientists how to do their job and do that work. But we are, however, ensuring that as soon as those approvals happen, we are ready uh, to deliver these tests across the country. Health Canada says it has drastically sped up a process that used to take months to grant companies approval in a mere 40 days. Not fast enough for some provinces already struggling to contain a second wave. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. MPs are preparing for what could be a very long night. They will debate a COVID-19 benefit bill the government has decided to also make a vote of confidence. Today, debate is being shut down again on an another piece of legislation that could help Canadians but probably will be very flawed. While the opposition is playing politics, we continue to focus on delivering for Canadians the help they need. Bill C-4 was fast-tracked this afternoon, infuriating opposition critics. The legislation consists of billions of dollars in benefits for Canadians transitioning away from the CERB, which wraps up this week. If it fails, the government could fall, though the NDP has said it will support it. The U.S. presidential election is 34 days away. Both Donald Trump and Joe Biden have warned that the other threatens the country and democracy. But... They confronted each other on the stay, same stage tonight for the first televised debate. With more than 40 million Americans unemployed, with the pandemic upheaval and scandal dominating the headlines, this was a critical debate at an unprecedented moment. Susan Ormiston watched the debate from our Washington bureau. It is done. It went very late. What was the tone on that stage? Oh, Adrian, <laughs> it was the most chaotic U.S. presidential debate probably in history. Combative from the start with Biden calling Trump a clown, Trump saying Biden wasn't smart, each telling the other to button it. That's nice. And constantly talking over each other. Here's a bit of a taste. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, would you answer that because question? the you question want to put is a lot of the new question Supreme is Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut who is up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This who is, is on your so list? right, gentlemen. Is, I think this we've is ended so this. He's going to pack the court. We have end, oh, no, no, not going to give a list. We have ended this segment. We're going to move on to the second segment. That was really a pr productive segment, wasn't it? <laughs> Keep yapping, man. The people understand, Joe. Well, wow. okay, so much over talking there. Uh, you know, when you step back from it, what did each one gain or lose? Well, Biden may have put to bed the doubts that have been seeded by Trump and his followers that Biden is sleepy or not all there, as Trump would say. 
Trump gave what many of his supporters love. It was a gladiator's performance. He needed a forceful approach to uh, get something from this debate, looking to reach the really sliver of American voters, maybe five or six percent who aren't dug in already. Uh, Trump t trails Joe Biden in national polls, six or seven points. Uh, but many analysts saying already that it was American viewers who lost out tonight. There was so much brawling and insults on both sides and some but very little forward vision. President Trump is being judged, of course, on his response to COVID, and it dogged him again tonight. They're going to be This is the same man it's who all told set you up. by Easter this had be gone away. By the warm weather, it'd be gone. Miraculous, like a miracle. And by the way, maybe you could inject some bleach in your arm, and that would take care of it. This is the that same man. That was said sarcastically, that was and you same, know that. I, that I, was I, said sarcastically. And so here's the deal. So there are worries about the integrity of the election itself. What, what did we learn on that, Susan? Not a whole lot new, Adrian. Trump heaped more doubt on the vote, refusing again to say that he would accept results of a fraudulent election. If I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. And I'll and tell what, you what, what does that from mean, a common sense, does that mean you're going to tell, tell your people means. to take to it the It means screen? you have a fraudulent election. You're and sending you out 80 million and ballots. They're not, they're not equipped to. These people aren't equipped to handle it. Number one. Number two, okay. they cheat. They cheat. So at the end of the night, I suppose when it comes to votes, do you think this debate changes any minds at all? It may harden some opinions. It was as nasty as many had feared. And, you know, it may discourage voters a bit. A lot of people talking about they're so fatigued from so much chaos and what they saw was a repeat tonight on both sides, Adrian. All right, Susan Ormiston in Washington. Thanks, Susan. And Katie Simpson was not far from the action on the outskirts of Cleveland at a Republican watch party. So Katie, how did the debate play out there? Well, the bar has finally cleared out. It was the busiest room I think I've seen with people indoors not wearing masks since the pandemic began. Uh, organizers say they were expecting up to 900 people here. There certainly were hundreds of people to watch the debate. And the debate really did not change any minds. You know, uh, you and Susan spoke about basically what a gong show everyone is calling the debate. People talking over one another, people not directly answering questions. That didn't really seem to upset people here or get a lot of attention here. The moments that really stood out were the moments where Donald Trump or Joe Biden were talking about issues of race, talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, talking about Antifa. And it was in those moments that we heard the loudest applause or the loudest cheers when any time Donald Trump made a point. And so as the bar was clearing out, we started talking to people and asking them what their standout moment was. And over and over and over, we've heard about uh, Donald Trump talking about law and order. There is great concern or there was great concern here in this crowd. And I have to say it was mostly white people. There were not uh, many people of color. In fact, we were here for four or five hours, and I don't think I saw one person of color. It really was a white crowd. And the biggest concern that everyone told me in the interviews after was they're concerned about Black Lives Matter. They accused the movement of burning down city, of looting, saying that the protests that they participate in are not peaceful, that they're rioting, and that there needs to be law and order in these cities. And they went on to repeat the talking points we've heard from the president, blaming Democrat-run cities and Democrat-run states. That really was the biggest issue that I heard from people here, not coronavirus. And we did ask people during the debate or before the debate about whether they had concern being in this room with so many people uh, and not wearing a mask. And no one really seemed to have concern. So when coronavirus came up as an issue, again, it didn't really get that much response. Oh, totally fascinating. So much to keep an eye on tonight. Katie, thanks very much. So obviously, there is a lot at stake for both Trump and Biden, which is why we have our U.S. politics panel standing by. We will get into the meaning of this moment in just a few minutes. Donald Trump, meanwhile, has granted a presidential permit for a $22 billion freight rail project connecting Alaska and Alberta. The news first came over the weekend when the president tweeted out his support for the private sector proposal it would see a new rail line being built from Fort McMurray north. It is far from a done deal, but today one hurdle was passed. The White House released a permit allowing track to be built across the border. In Vancouver today, an example of a kind of conflict many cities in this country are likely to see. 
more and more homeless Canadians are taking shelter in tent cities, and those are leading to tensions with neighborhood residents. It happened today in Vancouver. Susanna De Silva looks at how it's playing out there. Months of frustration boiled over onto the street. This is, a, in our minds, a, a disaster, right? This is a humanitarian crisis, and in any other disaster, a natural disaster, government would move quickly to set up shelters, to uh, mobilize resources. Residents living in houses near the sprawling tent city erected four months ago say they don't feel safe, with police reporting increases in property and violent crime. There's like feces at my kid's school, in my lane. But, you know, it's more just those people don't want to be using my kids' school as a bathroom. It's just not fair for them. And camp residents say they don't want to be here either. We share the same feelings. It's the only difference is you're not really able to <laughs> reflect or do anything, take yourself out of it. Angela Peterkin has been here three months. After her roommates moved out, she couldn't find a place she could afford. Then homeless, she lost her job. Being able to have like um, clean clothes and good hygiene and stuff like that, I think obviously reflects like the job interview um, kind of phase of things. So I just kind of feel like I'm stuck, stuck in a rut here. So it's not just something that's happening today. Tanya Fader has spent two decades working in Vancouver's downtown east side and says its homelessness can no longer be contained. Collectively, people need to realize this is all of our problem. This is not a downtown east side specific problem. This just happens to be the community that responded fast and earlier. She says more housing and more types of housing and addiction support is what's needed. And she's hopeful that perhaps increased frustration from neighborhoods seeing the problem like never before may force quicker action. The city of Vancouver is expecting a report from staff on options this week. This is actually the ridiculous onesie that I wear to stay warm at night. Peterkin just hopes the options come quickly. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. As COVID cases climb in Canada's largest city, many families are facing a crucial deadline. My threshold of tolerance ends at 500 cases a day. Next on the National, parents grapple with pulling kids out of school to go online instead. And as the NFL confirms COVID-19, we look at what lessons can be learned from a successful NHL ball. And a virtual vote, complete with glitches, cameos, even a bedtime story. Miss your Fergus. Another pandemic first. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. For families in Canada's largest school board, a month of uncertainty ends with a deadline. Just hours from now, they will have to decide where their kids will learn. As Deanna Sumanek Johnson shows us, an awful lot of teaching hasn't even begun. Damien Curran says he agonized over whether to send his kids back to school. And then, as infection numbers started to rise, when to pull them out. That day is today. My threshold of tolerance for uh, that level of social interaction at school kind of ends at 500 cases a day. It I, especially when a lot of them are here in Toronto. Wednesday's end of the month deadline is for families to switch their kids from in-person classes to online or the other way around. With infection numbers and school cases rising sharply, online classes are growing in popularity. I am looking for... Virtual learning may be safer, but it has its problems. We've had students uh, registered for classes without a teacher or vice versa, a teacher registered for a class with no accompanying student. It is unbelievable the amount of difficulties. I don't have a teacher. So. We checked in on two families we spoke to last week. Their kids still don't have online teachers. We are staffing as quickly as possible. And of course, there, there does have to be that couple of days of training uh, before they go into that virtual classroom. There could be more changes ahead if Wednesday's deadline pushes a lot of families to switch. Well, we can also pull some teachers out of our bricks and mortar schools to go virtual as well. Damien Kearns knows his kids won't have their first online class until October 13th, but he and his wife have made their choice. Oh, I think they're not going to be in school after today and we'll set up you know, regimes like we did during the lockdown, 
reading, uh, math exercises, uh, some physical health stuff. Families trying to listen to their instincts and get it right in a year where there's no such thing as obvious choices. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Another provincial government is sending voters to the polls in the midst of a pandemic. So the question over the course of, of this election campaign will be, who do you trust to lead Saskatchewan's economic recovery? Scott Moe wasted no time kicking off his re-election campaign just moments after meeting with the lieutenant governor to dissolve Saskatchewan's legislature. NDP leader Ryan Miley also launched his campaign today. A vote will take place on October 26th. Former Conservative MP Rob Anders is facing five charges relating to tax evasion. They cover 2012 to 2018, which overlaps partially with the time he held his seat. The former Calgary West MP helped found the Conservative Party of Canada and was a longtime advocate of lower taxes. He is scheduled to be in court on October 30th. Next, it is debate night in the United States. Trump and Biden go head to head for the first time and our U.S. political panel is standing by. And the NHL bubble bursts after a successful playoff season. Could this be the future of safe sports? This is an unprecedented U.S. election during unprecedented times. A global pandemic, a racial reckoning, and now a Supreme Court vacancy. Still, it all comes down to this. This election is about one thing and one thing only. It's Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Tonight, the first debate. I'm looking for Joe Biden to be incredibly strong with the facts. They'll be looking at whether the candidates are able to lay out clear themes for their campaigns. A campaign with implications for Canada on policy, trade, and so much more. What I want Canadians to know is just how consequential this next election will be. More than 600,000 eligible U.S. voters live in Canada. That's a number that could make a difference when the ballots are counted. So we've gathered our own U.S. political panel to help you through these next five weeks. My name is Yasha Munk. I come at this election as a scholar of populist movements around the world. My name is Danielle Moody, and my hope is for a Biden-Harris win. I'm Daniel McCarthy. I'm a conservative and will be voting for Donald Trump on November 3rd. All right, so joining me now, Daniel McCarthy, editor of Modern Age Journal and columnist for The Spectator, Danielle Moody the host of the podcast Woke AF Daily and co-host of the podcast Democracy-ish. Nyasha Monk is a contributing editor at The Atlantic and associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you all for being here. Daniel, Danielle, I see no problems mixing these up. Um, Yasha, though, I'd like to start with you. Very cranky evening, it appears. Who do you think <laughs> had uh, the best night? I, I don't know, but I think that, you know, the average age in the United States has gone up by about three years in the last two hours. Mm -hmm. um, look, I think it's a very messy draw. Um, I think nobody was able to get out uh, a full sentence or two, and that's mostly because Donald Trump interrupted Joe Biden uh, every 10 seconds. But I think a draw uh, probably favors Joe Biden. He's been ahead in the polls. Donald Trump really needed to change the dynamic of the race tonight, uh, and I don't think that he has done that. So, Daniel, Trump is known, obviously, as a showman on television. He loves the stage. How do you think he performed? I think he may have overplayed his hand somewhat here. Um, you know, American voters are not um, eager for the amount of excitement, perhaps, that they saw on the stage tonight. Uh, I could be wrong about that, however. I mean, Donald Trump is, is taking a big risk here, but his whole campaign back in 2016 was built on risks, and his uh, campaign in 2020 seems to be uh, willing to continue to push the envelope. Um, but I think he may have uh, gone a little too far, farther than most voters are willing to accept anyway. Uh, speaking of going far, Danielle, Joe Biden, as you know, said a little while ago that he knew he couldn't be baited into a brawl. His words, I can't be baited into a brawl with this guy. So if I may, let me play uh, this moment we have from earlier on in the debate, and then I'll ask you about it. Let people know he doesn't you're want to a senator. The I'm not going to answer the question Why because, you answer that because question? the you question want to put is a lot of the new question Supreme is Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, your, man? Listen, who? Will you shut up, man? So, uh, how did you feel when you saw that, Danielle? 
I felt that Joe Biden was es essentially expressing everything that Americans have been feeling for the past four years. Look, Donald Trump was very clear tonight that he does not care about the American public. He does not care about climate change. He does not care about escalating racism. He does not care um, uh, about the future of this country. What Donald Trump cares about is Donald Trump. Not even a sentence did he utter that was not dripping with condensation for the American public. Everything that he said, everything that he offered was about him and how great he is, how smart he is, that he doesn't pay taxes. Millions of Americans struggle each year to pay their taxes, but they do because they're paying into the American dream, which Donald Trump told them tonight was stupid, right, for them to do. So I, I, I think that it was, I don't think that it was a draw tonight. I think that Joe Biden showed what he needed to show was that he's the adult in the room. Daniel, let's talk about taxes for a second, about, about the revelations that uh, Trump paid only $750. I, I'm going to play a clip and then I'd really like you to weigh in on this, please. Will you tell us how much you paid in federal income taxes in 2016 and 2017? Millions of dollars. You paid millions of dollars? Millions in, of dollars. So yes. not 700 Millions of dollars. And you'll get to see I, it. I, and you'll get to when? see it. But and let me Shalom? just tell you, Chris, let me just tell you something, that it was the tax laws. I don't want to pay tax. Be before I came here, I was a private developer. I was a private business people. Like every other private person, unless they're stupid, they go through the laws, and that's what it is. Daniel, what did you make of, of how he handled that moment? Was it enough? Myself? Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Daniel McCarthy, yes. Uh, I think it was enough. Uh, again, Americans understand the way business works. They understand that if you have the kind of resources that Donald Trump has, uh, your revenues and your outflows are going to be irregular. In some years, you're going to have more income. In some years, you're going to have uh, losses and that there's going to be different tax um, sort of uh, effects based on what your business is doing. Uh, Yasha, do you believe that? Do you, do you think uh, Americans uh, accept that? I, I don't. Um, look, I think a lot of the reason why, Joe, uh, why Donald Trump won in 2016 is that people sort of believed his promises. They didn't think that all of the great things he was promising would come true, but they thought, you know what, this guy's a successful businessman. And, you know, he's done all these great things in his life, and he's telling us our country will be great. Let's give it a shot. Perhaps he really deliver on some of it. And for the last four years, they've seen that he hasn't delivered. They've seen uh, how badly the United States has dealt with COVID compared, for example, to Canada. They don't feel like they're better off today than they are four years ago. And I think a lot of them are starting to suspect that perhaps they were the mark, that perhaps Donald Trump is a little bit of a con man. Uh, and in terms of his taxes, he has two choices. Either he's a much less good businessman than he has claimed, uh, or he cheated on his taxes, uh, costing uh, the average American a lot of money. Neither of those look particularly good, and he certainly hasn't been able to talk himself out of that dilemma today. I'd like to talk about COVID a bit. Uh, it was one of the topics today, although it is the topic of our, of our time. Uh, Danielle, were you, were you satisfied with what you heard from Biden on the pandemic tonight? Yeah, I think that Joe Biden did a very good job of weaving in uh, the pandemic to every conversation that was being had. Look, we are in the middle of a global pandemic, and to pretend that it was going to be siloed to one topic of discussion was foolish. Um, 205,000 Americans are dead on Donald Trump's watch, uh, and he hasn't answered for that. He hasn't told us why he doesn't believe in science or follow the data or follow his own doctor's uh, warnings. And I think that Joe Biden reminded the American people today of that, that with COVID, if you've contracted COVID, and you've been able to survive it, you now have a pre-existing condition. Donald Trump isn't talking about that either. So I think that Joe Biden did a very good job of creating a boomerang effect, that everything that Wallace, the moderator, offered, that he would bring it back to COVID. Daniel, I suspect that's not how you see it at all, particularly in terms of the president's handling the pandemic. Well, it's not. And uh, I have to say, I don't think uh, Joe Biden had a very clear plan as to how he's going to deal with COVID. And it seems to me that one of the things he had to do was say, OK, you've had this situation happen under Donald Trump. If I were president, if Joe Biden were president, you would have a dramatically different result. And I don't think there was anything clear enough uh, on that point uh, being expressed by the vice president tonight. So uh, let's talk about another issue that came up, because they really went through a whole bunch of them. Uh, crucially, the Supreme Court. You, you know, Yasha, for someone who lives across the border, 
Uh, how critical is this to Americans, particularly to those deciding where to put a vote? Uh, well, it seems to me that it's very, very critical to Americans who are very clearly on the left or very clearly on the right. Um, control of the Supreme Court is extremely important to conservatives who hope to be able to undo uh, a whole bunch of legislation, including obviously most important Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court case that uh, uh, granted abortion rights as a matter of federal law. Uh, liberals want to preserve Roe v. Wade and be able to make more progress on things like campaign finance and so on. And so uh, to those political activists, this issue is incredibly important. Uh, I wonder whether those who are undecided or those who are in the middle uh, think about these things as much. Those tend to be voters who are less politically engaged, less politically informed. Uh, and to them, the question of the Supreme Court and the seat and who is this Amy Cohn Barrett and who was this Ruth Bader Ginsburg may seem a lot more abstract than it does to political junkies uh, like the people on this panel and like myself. Okay, time for one last question to each of you, so we'll keep it brief if we can. We'll start with you, Daniel McCarthy. I is it your sense that this debate, uh, I guess, mattered? Well, I don't know. I mean, it may have marginally shifted people into Biden's camp, but it may also have simply um, upset the apple cart so much that it's now a completely different uh, style of American politics that's going to prevail. And clearly, if it is this kind of hardball, uh, very aggressive style of politics, Donald Trump plays that much more strongly than anyone else does. It's All a right. question of whether he's changed the rules of the game. Danielle, just a few seconds to you. Sorry about that. Um, no, I don't think that the debate was incredibly consequential. I think that it was infuriating. And so maybe anger will be what motivates people to the polls. Interesting. And Yasha, last word to you. It mattered because, because it didn't matter. It mattered because it doesn't change the dynamics of the race, and that's helpful to Joe Biden. All right. Thank you all, Daniel McCarthy, Daniel Moody, and Yasha Monk. And we will be back next Wednesday, same okay. time, same place, to tackle the vice presidential debate. Kamala Harris versus Mike Pence. And after the break, California's wine country up in flames. Crews battle wildfires as, as tens of thousands are forced from their homes. Welcome back. Conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over a disputed border region is moving closer to all-out war. Dozens of people have been reported killed since clashes broke out. And as Chris Brown reports, there is worry it could threaten to draw the neighbors into the fight, including Turkey and Russia. This war between neighbors is being waged on the ground, in the air, and on YouTube. Video from Azerbaijan shows its forces blasting Armenian positions, while Armenia shows enemy soldiers getting shot at, trying to capture high ground. Armenia claims children are among its dead. My nine-year-old daughter was killed either by artillery or a bomb, says one man. Legally part of Azerbaijan, the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh has been governed by ethnic Armenians since the 90s. But now, with overt military help from its ally Turkey, Azerbaijan appears to be mounting a serious effort to retake it. Armenia claims Turkish drones are carrying out missions and that one of its jets was shot down by a Turkish aircraft, which Azerbaijan's president denies. We reached Artak Beglarian, who's in the territory's capital of Stepanakert. He was blinded by a landmine as a child and now serves as the human rights ombudsman. Armenians are at high risk and danger for massacres, for genocide elections. More than a million and a half Armenians were killed by the Ottoman Turks in the early part of the 20th century in a genocide Turkey still refuses to acknowledge. Russian TV showed video of both sides mobilizing for what appeared to be all-out war. Canadian-Armenian Rafi Elliott lives in the capital Yerevan with his wife and two children. Many people are lining up to contribute to donation drives for food, water, clothing, medical equipment for the people in Karabakh. Events are moving quickly. Russia has good relations with Azerbaijan, but stronger ties to Armenia and is trying to forge a ceasefire. But with Turkey, a NATO ally, taking a decisive role, the question is how much longer will Russia stay on the sidelines? Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. In Northern California, three people were killed and tens of thousands were forced to flee as crews battle major wildfires. Flames destroyed several homes and wineries and forced the evacuation of a hospital. But officials say 
Calmer winds today could give firefighters an edge. Fires have scorched over 1.5 million hectares in California since January. And Disney announced, announced it will lay off about 28,000 parks employees, most in the United States. The company shut down its theme parks globally when the pandemic hit, not including Disneyland in California. All gradually reopened with limited capacity. The company blames the layoffs on uncertainty about the pandemic's duration. Next on the National, the NHL scores a successful and safe end to the playoff season. The bubble burst without a single positive COVID test. Could this be the game plan for the future? Welcome back. The NFL's Tennessee Titans reported eight positive tests of COVID-19 among its players and staff. Team facilities for the Titans and their last opponent, the Minnesota Vikings, are now closed. There have been no positive cases among the Vikings so far. This is the first outbreak in the NFL involving players since the start of the season three weeks ago. Hockey players, meanwhile, are heading home to their families with the peace of mind that no one tested positive within the playoff bubbles. As Rafi Bujakanian tells us, this has some wondering whether that success could be recreated in the regular season. Look closely and it's not like any other Stanley Cup celebration. Fans at a distance, loved ones too. Everybody down on the ice who's still here has a phone. All on with someone. Probably Those someones kept far away on the other side of the so-called bubbles in Toronto and Edmonton, with Edmonton also hosting the four final teams. Local businesses key to making it all work, even if this barber had to go through a drastic wardrobe change. You know, first day I couldn't get my visor, shield sorted. My hands are all over the person in the chair. So, and then the fact that I um, I came and left every day, yeah. I think, you know, that that makes sense to me why they'd want to take full precaution. Right. There were more precautions too. Players and staff tested for COVID-19 every day for just over two months, made to wear masks in common areas and stay in their hotel rooms when they weren't on the ice or at planned excursions. This public health specialist who worked with the NHL says other leagues could adopt some safety measures. Being really religious about hand hygiene, mask use, if they feel unwell that they need to remove themselves from the sport um, and those kinds of things I think are going to be what keeps sports teams uh, healthy and not have it spread around. But the sports economist warns the bubble would be harder to set up for the regular season. Players would be asked to stay away from their families for four to six months and... The revenues that they're going to be able to generate aren't going to be the same. Certainly you'll have people watching on television, but if you're not driving those same revenues, you're not able to pay the players the same amount. Still, there is at least one more hockey bubble in the near future. The World Juniors host their tournament here at the end of December. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. Next on the National, the House of Commons' first virtual vote. And why the routine took so long. Our moment is next. What we'll do is we'll come back. Well, working from home has brought a host of technical challenges to many, most recently to the House of Commons. Members of Parliament participated in their first ever, ever virtual vote, which produced all the glitches and bloopers you might expect. And that's our moment. Working in government during a pandemic can probably be frustrating, but the first ever virtual vote in the Commons was a whole other level of frustration. Against the motion. To Erskine Smith, against. I vote against the motion. I didn't against, called. Oh no. Missed. <laughs> I vote against the motion. The routine vote that should have taken just 15 minutes ended up taking almost two hours. Ms. Fry, can you try uh, voting again? And I'm trying to. I have the microphone up against my mouth. I was indicated that that was definitely her voice, but we have to see her. Vote against the motion. Sometimes politics and technology just do not work well together. Please make sure that your microphone is on mute. Any kind of movement like kissing your children would activate your microphone and the camera comes on you. 
And so it goes. Uh, this did get really gong show-ish. Uh, one block MP accidentally voted against his own party's motion. Then the Speaker of the House of Commons have to, had to chastise everyone for taking selfies while they were doing this because that is not allowed. That is the National for September 29th. Good night.